My name is Sanjay Gupta. I'm a consultant cardiologist. Now, today's video is on the subject of tests for the heart. Okay, uh, what do all these heart tests tell us? So let's get started. Now, broadly speaking, there are three things that can go wrong with the heart. Okay, number one, the heart is a pump, and that pump may be faulty either due to a congenital problem or an acquired problem. So if the pump is in any way defective, that then not as much blood will come out of the heart and the body and all our vital organs will get less blood than they should. And this could lead to harm. So cardiomyopathies, valve problems, myocarditis, previous heart attacks, all cause a problem with the pumping function of the heart. Number two, the pump may be fine, but the pump needs a blood supply. And even though the pump itself may be strong, there may be a developing problem within the blood vessels, the coronary vessels. And if the blood vessels for any reason get blocked, then the heart gets damaged. This is how heart attacks happen. And therefore, a comprehensive evaluation of the heart should always include some assessment of the arteries that supply the heart with blood, even if the heart as a pump looks strong. And number three, the heart is also an electrically driven organ and therefore a malfunction of the electrics could lead to the heart malfunctioning as a pump, even if the pump were strong and this could then cause a problem. So virtually all the tests that we do on the heart are driven by the need to know more about the pumping ability of the heart, the heart arteries and the electrics of the heart. So today I wanted to talk to you about what each heart tells us about these different aspects of heart, uh, of the heart and heart disease. Now, number one, tests that tell you about the heart as a pump. Because remember we said one important thing was that the heart is a pump. So you want to know how well the heart functions. And so uh, when we think about tests that tell us about the heart as a pump, the most commonly used test to assess the heart as a pump is an echocardiogram. This is an ultrasound, a bit like the type that we use on pregnant women to look at the baby. And an ultrasound will allow us to visualize the heart, measure the sizes of the chambers, assess the heart valves, and work out how well the heart functions as a pump. If the heart has been left damaged, then that part of the heart will not be seen to move like undamaged parts, and this can therefore reliably tell us about persistent heart damage. This is important for two reasons. It tells us that if the heart looks strong, then it is unlikely that the patient's symptoms are due to underlying heart disease. And two, if the heart is strong, then the heart will cope with stress much better than if it were a damaged heart. So knowing about the pumping ability of the heart is extremely important. An echocardiogram is easy to do, it is risk-free, and it is generally easily accessible. It is also unique because it works using the Doppler effect, and you can therefore not only just get an anatomical evaluation of the heart, but you can also get a physiological assessment of the heart. Nevertheless, an echocardiogram does have limitations. Number one, it tells us about the present and the past but generally doesn't tell us much about the future, meaning that if your heart looks strong today, that doesn't mean it is guaranteed to remain strong tomorrow. You could have something happen and the heart could get damaged and therefore the echo is just telling you about whether you've got a strong heart now and it will also tell you that nothing bad has happened to your heart to damage it in the past. Number two, it is operator dependent and therefore requires specialized um, personnel and machinery, and therefore you can get interoperate, intra or interoperator variability in the reporting. Number three, the images you get may vary from patient to patient, and that means that you're using ultrasound to shine sound waves on the heart, and therefore you need a nice window, and some people, you know, just because of their body habitus, may not have a good enough window to be able to see the heart very clearly. Four, you don't get to see the heart in three dimensions. And because the heart moves in three different ways, you know, the heart is moving uh, like this, radially, longitudinally, and it's also twisting, you're only seeing mainly the heart moving uh, radially with uh, echo. I mean, there are people who've developed ways of trying to assess 
uh, longitudinal function of the heart, torque and torsion, but generally we're just looking at one way in which the heart moves, which is radially. And therefore, you're only getting a limited assessment of the heart. And you'd, and the other thing, of course, to say is with echo, you don't really get as good a sense of tissue composition. You're just looking to see whether the heart is moving. You can't really tell whether the reason the heart is not moving is because it's got a scar. If it has a scar, is it, is it um, what is the pattern of the scar? What could have caused the scar, etc.? So a more advanced way of studying the heart as a pump is through cardiac magnetic resonance, cardiac MRI. Cardiac MRI offers some great advantages over echocardiography. You get much better spatial resolution and therefore you get much clearer images of the heart. You have no imaging constraints, so you're not dependent on good pictures. You know, you will generally get good pictures with an MRI scan, no matter who you are. And MRI can also tell you about tissue composition. So you can actually look, so if there's an area that's not moving, you can look further using um, tissue characterization capabilities of MRI to tell you why that area isn't moving. So you can actually study the character of the tissue of the heart. Again, there are problems with cardiac MRI as well. It is a super specialized discipline. It requires very expensive machinery. It is inherently uncomfortable for the patient as you have to lie in a tight tunnel for up to an hour. Patients with pacemakers, metal implants cannot be exposed to such strong magnetic fields. Uh, overall though, a normal cardiac MRI is, is even more reassuring than a normal echocardiogram. Are there any other tests that can tell us about the heart as a pump? Well, there are. A simple standard 12-lead ECG can be helpful. The ECG is basically telling you about the journey of the electrical signals as they travel through the heart. And therefore, if there is a problem with the heart uh, as a pump, such as previous damage, then the ECG pattern that we see may change from what a normal pattern should look like. Remember, it has to be a 12-lead ECG because you're look, trying to look uh, at the heart from different angles. Otherwise, if you only look at it with one lead or three leads, you're getting a very skewed view, meaning you may have a problem on the side that the ECG is not looking at. A normal ECG is generally reassuring, but does not give you anywhere near the amount of information that you would get from an echocardiogram or an MRI scan. But nevertheless, it's a useful screening tool because if you go to your doctor with a complaint, it may take a little while for him to organize the echocardiogram so you can have an ECG. And if the ECG is normal, that's reassuring, but that does not mean that you don't need an echocardiogram if your symptoms warrant it. Then there is also a blood test, and the blood test is called BNP. Now, when the heart is not functioning optimally, it struggles to get the blood out with as much vigor, and therefore the pressure within the heart increases. As the pressure increases, the chambers of the heart stretch and release this biochemical called BNP. And what this biochemical does is it serves to open up our blood vessels and thereby reduce the pressure on the heart. So, and BNP can be measured, and if the BNP is exceptionally high, then it is likely that the heart is not working as well as a pump as it should. The advantage of BNP is that it is just a simple blood test. Anyone can do it. The disadvantage is that BNP can sometimes be high for other reasons, and therefore you can have false positive BNP readings. However, a normal BNP is generally quite reassuring. So these are the tests that look at the structure of the heart, okay? Um, echo, MRI, ECG perhaps, and BNP gives you some assessment of the structure function of the heart, so to speak. Now let's talk about the second thing that can go wrong with the heart, and that is narrowing of the blood vessels. So the heart as a pump is fine, but the blood vessels supplying it are in some way compromised. Now generally an ECG or echo do not tell you about the blood vessels until when the blood vessels are so critically narrowed that the heart muscle actually starts suffering. If you have narrowings in blood vessels, which are only stopping blood from getting through at times of stress or exercise, then an ECG or an echo at rest being completely normal does not rule out a problem. So when we're trying to assess the heart arteries, we need different tests uh, to the ones that I've already mentioned. And the tests you can do to look at the heart arteries or to study the heart arteries can broadly be divided into two types, anatomical tests 
and functional tests, and they actually offer complementary information. Now, anatomical tests, these basically look for coronary disease. You are trying to visualize in some way the heart arteries. The gold standard test is an invasive angiogram where a catheter is inserted into an artery, pushed all the way up, dye is injected to, through into the coronary arteries, and this way the lumen of these arteries is delineated and any narrowings can be easily identified. The advantage of an angiogram is that if a narrowing is detected, it can be fixed with a stent at the same sitting as you're already inside the body. An invasive angiogram is very much the gold standard, but because it is an invasive test, it does carry some risk, uh, risk of damage to the blood vessels or the heart, and also it requires exposure to radiation, and therefore invasive angiography tends to be best reserved for high-risk patients. Another anatomical test that is now increasingly being utilized is CT angiography. This is a non-invasive test where a dye is injected into the back of the hand. The heart is slowed down to prevent too much movement and pictures of the heart and its blood vessels are taken in a CT scanner. And this is an exceptionally good test because it tells us not only about the present but also about the future. Patients with a completely normal CT scan are very unlikely to have a heart attack within the next three to five years. The problem with CT scanning, however, is that if you, is if you see something, uh, so if it's normal, it's very reassuring, but sometimes uh, there may be some plaque, which is just not causing a major problem, but it's there. And a lot of plaque has calcium in it, and calcium is very reflective, and therefore may obscure what is behind it, meaning that it's a little bit like um, taking a picture with a flash in a mirror. You don't see the face behind the flash because the flash obscures the picture. Um, so in that sense, you know, if you have a lot of calcium, you may not be able to assess how narrow the vessel is, but the presence of calcium tells you that there's some coronary disease there. And um, so, you know, if the CT angiogram is normal, it is wonderful news because it makes it very unlikely something bad's going to happen to you as a result of blockage of the heart arteries in the next three to five years. If you, de if you do see coronary disease uh, and if there's a lot of calcium, many patients will then end up having to require a invasive angiogram to clarify exactly how tight it is because on an invasive angiogram, you're not worried about this calcium reflecting, you're just studying the pattern of the dye. Right, so these are the anatomical tests. Now the functional tests. These tests are not directly looking at the coronary arteries, but they're looking at the heart muscle and telling us whether the heart muscle is getting all the blood it needs when it needs it. These are therefore not looking for coronary disease, but instead they're looking for ischemic heart disease. They don't tell you if you have any narrowings, but they do tell you if you have a significant narrowing that is so significant that it is actually preventing blood from getting through to the heart muscle. If there is a demand supply mismatch, then it is most likely to show up during stress. And therefore all these tests, these functional tests are done by inducing stress in the patient, either via exercising the patient or giving the medications to speed the heart up. So common functional tests that we use are ECG stress tests. Here a patient is attached to an ECG and stressed on a treadmill. And we look at the ECG to see if there are any changes that develop as the patient's heart is stressed. An ECG stress test is easily available, but as you are only relying on the ECG, you, not, you do not get as much information as you could by actually visualizing the heart, such as with an echocardiogram. In addition, uh, Particularly in women, you can get a very high rate of false positive results, and therefore we don't do exercise ECGs in women routinely now. Next step, and a step better, is a stress echocardiogram. Here an echocardiogram, the ultrasound is done at rest, and then the patient is stressed, and when the heart is working really hard, the echocardiogram is repeated, and then we compare the two pictures. If the heart muscle looks like it's working and pumping harder at stress compared to rest, then we can conclude that there can't be a significant narrowing in the blood vessels, uh, because if there were a significant narrowing, then that part of the heart will not get better with exercise. It will get worse. 
and therefore you can easily see that because you can see that the heart is pumping nicely at rest and it's all pumping better on exercise that's telling you that all the blood is getting there and therefore you can assume that there is no significant narrowing that's stopping blood from getting through another way is a stress perfusion scan a myoview scan a thallium scan here patients are given some dye the dye goes where the blood goes and the heart lights up in dye because the heart is covered with blood so you see all this blood in the heart and on a scanner that lights up because of this dye we then exercise the patient give the dye again and take another image if we see that the heart is covered in dye at rest and then similarly on exercise then we can conclude that there is no restriction to blood if on the uh, to blood flow if on the other hand we see that at stress there is an area that does not light up with dye uh, then we uh, think or we that suggests a heart artery narrowing remember functional tests tell you about ischemia and anatomical tests tell you about coronary disease it's important to uh, differentiate the two because it is still possible to have ischemia without coronary disease. For example, if a patient is very anemic, they have very little blood, then the heart may still suffocate due to a lack of blood, even in the absence of coronary disease. The heart could still become ischemic even in the absence of coronary disease. So the next step is the third set of tests you want to do is to try and work out if there are electrical problems with the heart. Unfortunately, electrical problems can only be diagnosed when they're actually happening. It is impossible to predict electrical problems. What I mean is that just because I have a normally pumping heart and normal blood vessels, it does not make me immune to developing a heart rhythm problem. The reassuring thing, however, is that if I do have a normally pumping heart and normal blood vessels, then it is unlikely that most heart rhythm disturbances will be dangerous to me because my heart is, will be able to cope, even if the heart rate goes up to 200 beats per minute because the heart is strong at rest and it's getting all the blood supply, all the blood it needs. So even if the heart goes up, it should be able to cope. So, um, you know, so that's why when people go with palpitations, a lot of times doctors want to do an echocardiogram, make sure they don't have structural heart disease because whilst they may not be able to work out exactly why that patient is getting the palpitation, just knowing that they have a strong heart and their blood supply is okay uh, is very reassuring because it tells us that the body will cope with a heart which goes very fast. In terms of diagnosing heart rhythm abnormalities, we can only accurately diagnose a problem if you catch it happening on ECG. Usually even a single lead ECG is enough because rhythm is rhythm. You'll see it, whether you see it on one lead or six leads, the rhythm is the rhythm, right? So even a, one lead is enough for that. Um, so when a patient has palpitations, the only way to catch the palpitation is to provide the patient with a heart monitor for as long a duration as possible in order to maximize the chances of catching it. If the patient has noticed a particular trigger, such as exercise, stress, then one can try and provoke the symptoms whilst the patient is wearing the monitor. So if someone comes to me and says, look, you know, I'm getting palpitations when I exercise, the sensible thing is that I exercise them and see what happens. If on the other hand, they say, look, I get my palpitations after I've eaten, then I would say, here's a heart monitor, try and eat, try and bring them on so that I can see what's going on. Because unless you can bring them on whilst you're wearing the monitor, I can't categorically tell you what these palpitations are due to. There are different types of monitors available and it is only worth getting one that is of long enough duration to catch the symptoms. Now, most places use a 24-hour halter monitor, which generally is a waste of time because it is generally uncommon for patients to get their symptoms reliably within a mere 24-hour period. More recently, it is now possible to acquire wearable patches that can record continuously for one week, two weeks and even four weeks. The most reliable way, however, is a reveal device, which is a tiny device that can be implanted under the skin that is constantly on the patient and it has a battery life of up to two years. And this will catch any rhythm disturbances during that period. So this is basically a run through uh, through all the tests that we do in cardiology, the common tests we do in cardiology. This brings me to the end of this talk. I hope you found it useful. I would love to hear your thoughts. And once again, thank you so much for listening.